Hi everyone, welcome to another video lecture from Tom Kennedy Science. And I'm of course your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. And we're continuing on with some biology lectures for cell and molecular biology. And today we're gonna focus on enzymes. And of course what I'm showing right here is a large enzyme called amylase. You're familiar with amylase, you, you experience it every day. You know when you, you cook a pizza or you order pizza or you go to a restaurant and get a slice of pizza or a whole pie. Wait, did I talk about pizza? I love pizza. At any rate, if you're hungry, you'll start to salivate. Mm, starting to salivate a little bit here. Haven't had breakfast yet. That saliva has proteins in it that help start to digest your food. And one of those is amylase. And this is a, a structural view of what amylase looks like. Pretty wild, isn't it? So what I'm going to do today is we're going to talk about what enzymes are and how they work, and including how they are regulated. So there's this classical view of how enzymes work. But let me slip over here and get the next screen. I just want to say that in the last few decades, you know, biology, like many other fields of science, are rapidly advancing. And we're discovering all kinds of new things. And what I want to talk about really quick is that although I'm going to prevent, although I'm going to present this uh, classical view of how enzymes work, classical physics is based kind of like on Newton's physics. Force equals mass times acceleration. There's a law of gravity that tells you how you fall to the earth. You know, thermodynamics are these kind of classical physics um, issues. But it, starting a oh, little bit before the 1920s and all through the 20s and 30s, scientists discovered that the world at the level of atoms is really weird. And we've always thought that, you know, this weird quantum effect just kind of washes out when we start talking about biological systems. But we might not be so correct on that. And it turns out that the classical view of how enzymes work, that they, they lower activation energy, and that's something we're going to talk about in a little bit. I'm, I'm going to explain what activation energy is. But it's always been thought that enzymes kind of had this lock and key fit, and it, 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 it slips the, the enzymes in there and lowers the activation energy and then um, uh, allows this, this reaction to proceed. But there's some evidence that that weird world of quantum physics plays an important role in enzymes and that the shape of enzyme is, is there not just a lower activation energy, but to do something called quantum tunneling. So let me explain really quick. You know, at the scale of atoms, things like particles, like electrons, you know, electrons form bonds. They act like a wave or a particle. And in fact, they're acting like waves and they're in multiple places at once. I know that just defies the reality of the logic of our world. But yes, electrons are in multiple places at once as they are a wave and you know they're moving like waves right and they're everywhere and then all of a sudden you look at them and they're like oh i'm a particle now i went from being a wave to an actual particle it's so weird and they can be uh entangled with each other so you could have these two particles separated by not tiny distances but large distances you hit one it affects the other it's really weird and um you know these these weird quantum effects um, they may adjust their shape to accommodate something known as quantum tunneling. All right, and this is a phenomena where electrons can act as a wave, okay, and they can propagate through an energy barrier. I know, so enzymes are still helping out with that energy barrier, but here's a here's a um here's an example of how it works. You know, you got an energy barrier, like I said, you you need a supply of energy to break a bond. Just imagine you you need energy to go up and over a hill, right? To go up a hill requires energy. If you put a ball at the bottom of a hill, it will never, ever, ever, ever go up that hill, ever, <laughs> to the end of time, unless you kick it up the hill or push, and that requires energy. Quantum tunneling. This is where it gets weird, right? The electrons are moving as waves, and they can actually go through the hill and pop up on the other side. It's like the hill never existed. It's like the energy barrier never existed. The, the electrons can quantumly tunnel through the energy barrier. And we think that enzymes are actually taking um, advantage of quantum tunneling. And it's not just simply they're lowering the activation energy barrier. They're actually going through it. I, I know, it's so weird. 
but I'm not going to teach that. That is for fun. I know I started the first four minutes of this, but hey, you know, in science, sometimes it's it's really fun to talk about the, the fun parts of it and what we're learning and what's new. And in fact, in five to 10 years in biology, we may be actually teaching quantum tunneling in our introductory biology courses for enzymes. And if anybody's interested in this, there's a really good book. It's called Life on the Edge by Al Kahili. That book has made me rethink how I think about biology at the cell and molecular level. And this is what we're teaching here is cell and molecular biology. And it turns out that quantum effects are way more important for life than we ever thought. And I posted a link here from the scientists. And it's a really good explanation of, of how quantum tunneling works in biology. It, it's not required for you guys in my classes, but it is something that I think some of you might find really interesting. Okay, now let's get back to classical physics classical biochemistry and classical biology. And like I said, the classics part of this is we're looking at the universe on a large scale. We're not gonna uh, take into account um, quantum effects because basically this is how everybody taught it. Um, and it's not entirely incorrect either. But basically think about this. I know I always go back to what is life, right? Life is an emergent property of a complex system. And that complex system is all of these chemical reactions that are breaking things down, transferring energy, and building stuff up. So, you know, chemical reactions occur on their own. I mean, you can leave your piece of paper out, and over time, if you leave it in the sun especially, it'll start to turn yellow, wrinkle, and eventually will disintegrate. But it will take decades, decades for that to happen, not centuries. That's because the rate at which the oxygen molecules in the atmosphere interact with the cellulose in the paper to break it down is incredibly slow. So, life uses protein enzymes to speed up chemical reactions. And the classical view of this is there's an energy barrier to start a chemical reaction. You need energy to break the bonds, even in exergonic reactions. And you know this, to get a fire going, you need a little flame. Endergonic reactions, as you know, require more energy. So what these things do is they lower the activation energy, right? And, uh, that's what enzymes do. So that's really important. Now, we still need that in an input of energy here. So like I said, energy is still very important here. And uh, we're going to be expanding on this, which is pretty cool. So there it is, activation energy. Any chemical reaction has an energy barrier. So enzymes are catalysts. And what they do is they take your reactants, right? And because these reactants are going to bind to an enzyme, we're gonna call them a substrate as well. So your substrates are, are also reactants. And you know what these enzymes are gonna do is they're gonna help align these reactants in the exact right way. It's kind of like a, uh, a lock and key fit, right? And um, you know, there's these repulsive forces of the electrons. They're gonna repel each other. So they, you've gotta get them in the right way and then stick them together. And that's why you need kinetic energy. That's why you need this energy extra energy to help these things happen as well. So one thing about enzymes is that there are thousands of different types of enzymes. I mean, you remember um, in the last, if you watch my last lecture, you, you learned about uh, kinases and phosphatases. A kinase is, it got the A-S-E, that means it's an enzyme, that means it's gonna catalyze a reaction. And then it's a, if it's a kinase, it's sticking phosphate groups onto molecules and we have thousands of different types of kinases and their sole function is to stick phosphate groups on different types of molecules. So our bodies have, our, each one of our cells has thousands if not tens of thousands of different types of enzymes, each carrying out a specific chemical reaction. And the way they do this is if you notice, the enzymes all have specific shapes and they have a specific region on them called the active site. And the active site is where the substrate is going to bind. And that's where the chemical reaction is going to take place. And interestingly, uh, if you remember one of my other lecture videos, I talked about abiogenesis and how um, you have uh, the origins of life occurring in these little chemical reactors in an alkaline vent. And basically, you're taking like carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas and reacting them together to create uh, organic molecules. And lining those, those little reaction chambers are metal ions like zinc, magnesium, iron, 
a lot of these enzymes at their active sites also use metal ions. And then the rest of the protein there is just to bring in the right substrate so that the ion can help, that the, the metal can actually help um, facilitate the chemical reactions. Pretty cool. Okay, so a substrate is going to bind to an active site and it's usually going to bind to it weakly with things like hydrogen bonding so the substrate can come in and out very, very quickly. And um, once the substrate binds to the active site, we call that an induced fit. And remember, our enzyme proteins are made up of um, amino acids, right? And amino acids, so there's 20 of them, all determined by their R groups. And the R groups will line up around that active site and help not only get the substrate in there, but also form weak bonds with it. So it holds it in there shortly, but often not permanently. And that's the problem with toxins that wipe out our enzymes is they'll often bind to those active sites permanently and, and prevent them, the enzymes from working. Oh, before I go on, um, one more thing about enzymes is they speed up the rate of these chemical reactions. They're not used up. They, they can be used over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, so here's an example of how uh, you've got your substrates. These are the reactants. Uh, and what they're going to do is they're going to bind specifically to an active site. So once your substrate binds to the um, active site, you have an enzyme substrate complex. Then what's going to happen is the active site is going to lower um, the the activation energy. And the way it's thought is that the when the when the substrates bind in there, the protein enzyme will often change shape. And imagine um, you, you've got a bond like this, and you you change shape, and you put pressure on that bond. You bend it, and that puts a lot of extra potential energy into it, which makes it easier to break. So you're lowering the activation energy. And then it, it uh, facilitates a chemical reaction. It catalyzes it, and then it releases your products. Okay, And like I said, this is the classical view of how enzymes um, speed up chemical reactions.